Good morning and welcome to our service in Christ's most precious name. We're going to begin by simply turn to a passage in Isaiah chapter 33. Now before we just go there, a few announcements. Um, May's coming up and the first Sunday of May normally is our day for Lord's Supper. So what we've been thinking is, what I'll do is have a segment of Lord's Supper, a message over here in the, on the online. If you wish to join us, no problem, you can join us. Just simply make sure that you have at home some water wafers and a bit of um, grape juice so you can participate with us. If you don't wish to, no problem. But just for the sake of having Lord's Supper once a month, until these restrictions get lifted, what we'll do is online have Lord's Supper. You can join us. If not, no problem at all. No problem. All right, and also the following Monday, uh, following Sunday, May 10, is Mother's Day. If we can't be together, at least do something special for your mums. I mean, think about it. If you can't, we can't be together here, at least try to do something special with your mums. So make it a true Mother's Day for them. All right, we're into Isaiah chapter 33 this morning. Isaiah 33, read the whole 24 verses. Woe to thee that spoilest, and thou wast not spoiled, and dealest treacherously, and they dealt not treacherously with thee. When thou shalt cease to spoil, thou shalt be spoiled. And when thou shalt make an end to, to deal treacherously, they shall deal treacherously with thee. O Lord, be gracious unto us. We have waited for thee. Be thou their arm every morning, our salvation also in the time of trouble. At the noise of the tumult, the people fled. At the lifting up of thyself, the nations were scattered. And your spoil shall be gathered like the gathering of the caterpillar, as the running to and fro of locusts shall he run upon them. The Lord is exalted, for he dwelleth on high. He hath filled Zion with judgment and righteousness. And wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times, and strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. Behold, their valiant ones shall cry without. The ambassadors of peace shall weep bitterly. The highways lie waste. The wayfaring man ceaseth. He hath broken the covenant. He hath despised the cities. He regardeth no man. The earth mourneth and languisheth. Lebanon is ashamed and hewn down. Shown is like a wilderness, and Bashan and Carmel shake off their fruits. Now will I rise, saith the Lord. Now will I be exalted. Now will I lift up myself. Ye shall conceive chaff. Ye shall bring forth stubble. Your breath as fire shall devour you, and the people shall be as the burnings of lime. As thorns cut up shall they be burned in the fire. Hear ye that are far off what I have done, and ye that are near acknowledge my might. The sinners of Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has surprised the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? And who, who shall dwell with the everlasting burnings? He that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly, he that despiseth the gain of oppressions, that shaketh his hands from holding of bribes, that stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood, and shutteth his eyes from seeing evil. He shall dwell on high with the place of defence, and uh, with, the, with his, his place of defence shall be the munitions of the rocks. Bread shall be given him, his water shall be sure. Thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty. They shall behold the land that is very far off, Thine heart shall meditate terror. Where is the scribe? Where is the receiver? Where is he that could count the towers? Thou shalt not see a fierce people, a people of deeper speech than thou canst perceive, of a stammering tongue that thou canst not understand. Look upon Zion, the city of our solemnities. Thine eyes shall see Jerusalem, a quiet habitation, a tabernacle that shall not be taken down, not one of the stakes thereof shall ever be removed, nor shall any of the cords thereof be broken. But there the glorious Lord will be unto us a place of broad rivers and streams, wherein shall go no galley with oars, neither shall gallant ship pass thereby. For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king. He will save us. Thy tacklings are loosed. They could not well strengthen their mast. They could not spread the sail. Then is the prey of a great spoil divided. The lame shall take the prey. And the inhabitant shall not say, I am sick. The people that dwell therein shall be forgiven their iniquity. Let's please bow for prayer. 
Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your goodness to us. We have your word to sustain us and to keep us and to uphold our hearts, Lord, in times of difficulty. We thank you, Lord, that you are God and nothing upon earth can change that fact. Give us the grace, Lord God, to always look up to thee as exalted upon thy throne in heaven and soon to come to us through Jesus Christ. For it's in your name we thank you and pray. Amen. The topic this, this morning is God is exalted. Now, as we read through the Bible, there's a central theme that goes right throughout every book of the Bible, and that is God reigns in his creation. He is the creator, the master, the ruler of the universe. He sets up kings, he puts down kings. He establishes governments, he removes governments. He is the one, only living God upon planet Earth, king of his creation. And there's no wisdom or counsel or judgment that can oppose God's way, nothing. Now, as his redeemed people, saved from the bondage of sin, we're specially called to bow down before him and worship him. The book of Psalms is full of praise to God. There's one psalm in particular, Psalm 99, I want to just uh, go to for a moment. In this psalm over here, um, it gives a wonderful uh, example of God being exalted in our response to him. In Psalm 99, the Lord reigneth, let the people tremble. He sitteth between the cherubims, let the earth be moved. Cherubims referring to the angels about the throne of God in heaven. The Lord is great in Zion. He is high above all people. Let them praise thy great and terrible name, for he is holy, or for it is holy. The king's strength also loveth judgment. Thou dost establish equity. Thou executest judgment and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt ye the Lord our God, and worship at his footstool, for he is holy. Now, that is God, our holy God, our exalted God. In our text, in Isaiah chapter 33, we have the sixth and final plague, or final woe, that is cast upon uh, God's enemies. And as we read in Psalm 99, God will be exalted in all circumstances, not just amongst his people, but throughout the whole world, culminating in the time of Messiah's reign in his kingdom. Psalm 145.10 says, All thy works shall praise thee, O Lord, and thy saints shall bless thee. So in this passage today, we're going to see five different things that shows God exalted. First, God is exalted in his judgments. And that's something we cannot deny, the way God judges. God exalted in the prayers of faith of his saints. God's exalted in the way he ends those prayers. God exalted in his righteous people that obey him and walk with him. And finally, God will be exalted in his kingdom that he will establish as Christ at his head. First thing we notice over here is God is exalted in judgment. Now, judgment over his enemies, uh, time of Noah's flood, when God uh, destroyed the whole world in the flood, I think that is something if you stop and, if, stop and contemplate, you will definitely fear God in a righteous manner. We think about the way God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah with fire from heaven. You stand back and see something like that in your mind's eye, and again, you stand in awe. Think about the plagues in Egypt, where Egypt, the strongest nation on earth at that time, and we find Israel in bondage to them, and God sends down plagues from heaven, impossible plagues, whereby he destroyed not just the Egyptians in their land, but gave a testimony that exalted him greatly. In Exodus 7, 5, when God sets Israel free from bondage, the Bible says, and the Egyptians shall know that I am Jehovah. I am the Lord. Exodus chapter 8, verse 22, when God put some of the plagues upon Egyptians and separated the Israelites from them so they, had, they did not receive the plagues, the Bible says, that thou mayest know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. And God raised up Pharaoh to manifest his power and that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. The result of God's work on Egypt was that Forty years later, in Canaan, when Israel were going to the end of Canaan, the people of Jericho feared greatly for what they had heard that God had done 40 years ago, plus also to the kings of Og and, and uh, Sihon in, um, in the area of uh, Bashan and uh, Gilead. The present situation is shown in uh, 2 Kings chapter 18. This is the historical context. In 2 Kings 18, verses 13 to 17, the Bible says, Now in the fourteenth year of King Hezekiah, did Sennacherib, king of Assyria, come up against all the fenced cities of Judah and took them. 
And Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria, to Lachish, saying, I have offended, return from me. That which thou puttest on me will I bear. The king of Assyria appointed Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. And Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. At that time did Hezekiah cut off the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord and from the pillars which Hezekiah, king of Judah, had overlaid and gave it to the king of Assyria. And the king of Assyria sent Tartan and Rabsaris and Rabshakeh from Lachish to King Hezekiah with a great host against Jerusalem. And they went up and came to Jerusalem. And when they were come up, they came and stood by the conduit of the upper pool, which is on the highway of the fuller's field. Now, I don't need to read any more. In the 14th year of King Hezekiah's reign of Judah, a Syrian army headed by Sennacherib came over and started to conquer cities one by one in Judah. So what, we, what happened was that Hezekiah, in fear of the Assyrian um, nation, went ahead and made a treaty with Sennacherib. And Sennacherib said, OK, I'll stay away from you. Just pay me 300 shekels of, uh, of silver, uh, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. So Hezekiah went and got that amount of money and he raised up from his nation, tearing off from part of his buildings that had been overlaid with gold to give him the money. When he gave him all the money, Sennacherib took the money, broke his treaty and continued to come against Jerusalem. And this is, this is uh, on, on, on um, the Syria side, absolutely no justification. The Bible says they were not spoiled by Jerusalem, yet they want to spoil them. They were not dealt treacherously by Jerusalem, yet they'll deal treacherously to them. Now, here we have a great big threat. We have a nation that's very, very strong. They do what they want to do, and it seems you just can't stop them. You just can't stop them. There's a lot of evil going along, and you just can't stop them. Well, we can't, but God can. He's the God of retribution. Now, this is for Sam's benefit, who reckons every message I preach has to have a coronavirus message somewhere. Okay, here's one for you, Sam. There are many reports that have been circulated which really, if you listen to them, will instill fear in your heart, uneasiness in your heart. Now, I've been listening to a few bits and pieces that people send me, and I'm sure if I get them, you've got them too, because I'm the last person to get this type of stuff. And see, these, these different sinister reports of conspiracy theories that the, corona, the coronavirus today was manufactured in a laboratory it's man-made. It didn't come from animals and bats in China. And it was done on purpose and spread throughout all this world on purpose, goes the theory. Now, I am not embracing these theories. I'm telling you what they say. And what's the reason for this? Well, they're aimed at the elderly because the elderly are people who are non-productive in society. And the elderly are people who drain society of all these funds from the government to keep them alive and keep them going when they give nothing back. So this is a means of getting rid of these people who are drawing our resources from us. That's one conspiracy theory. Another one is, well, you see, the, the world's elite are by this means gaining greater and greater power as they gain full control of this world. And the few leaders are ruling this whole world. And the idea is this also, that they're going to have a forced immunisation system that whereby they'll induce into people some sort of bug that'll make them a slave to their, to their whims and all the rest of stuff. And then you have also, there's the economical side of things where, man, the pharmaceutical companies and the media and many other places are gaining billions of dollars profit from all this noise and havoc going around and all this fear going around. Now, the more and more you listen, the more and more of these different theories come around. And honestly, if you give credence to them, you start to worry. You start to fear. You start to panic. Now, Israel had a right to fear and panic because the enemy was right at their doorstep. The enemy that conquered nation after nation after nation. Now, the Bible says, if you know, whatever's happening, it says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. I'll give you a genuine, genuine conspiracy theory that's not a theory that is genuine. And this has been rampant for a long time to come. In our world today, all world events have been leading, leading up to four major things. There's going to be a worldwide government. There's going to be a worldwide religion. And there's going to be a worldwide economic system. And on top of this will be a worldwide ruler. 
This ruler's name is going to be Antichrist. And he's going to be set up by all the nations of the world to be the hero who will save this world from his present dilemma. And what was that? Well, the rapture. Christians are taken away. Millions and millions of people suddenly disappear. There's havoc reign because of that. And this man's going to come up and say, I will show you the way. And they'll put their whole faith and trust in him. And then he will come up and destroy religions. We're told that in Revelation 17 where the woman that rides on the beast, the woman is a, is a relig- false religion, the beast is Antichrist, he destroys her in his own power. And then he'll go ahead and force governments to follow him and declare himself to be God. And then he'll go ahead and try and destroy God's people, be responsible for the deaths of millions of people. No one upon this earth has done or will do as much damage as Antichrist. And God will destroy him. And he will find his end in the lake of fire where he will suffer eternity. As a matter of fact, he'll be the very first occupant of the lake of fire. The Bible says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Don't worry about different viruses and bugs. Don't worry about different problems that come our way. You worry about God. Fear not him that can destroy the body. Fear him that can destroy both body and soul in hell. He's the one to fear. No one else but him. So we find that God is exalted in his judgment. You happy, Sam? Next one. God is exalted in our prayers. And this is beautiful. We come to God in prayer, in faith, in trust. That honours God. Jerusalem was surrounded by a Syrian army. Hezekiah, in a moment of weakness, tried to make plans and and, uh, sort a treaty with Sennacherib, gave him money, and the money was taken, treaty broken. No hope now except for God. There's no hope but God. So Hezekiah sent a message to uh, Isaiah the prophet saying, Isaiah, pray for us. And in 2 Kings chapter 19, verses 1 to 7 we read, And it came to pass, when King Hezekiah heard it, which is the letter from uh, Sennacherib threatening to destroy the nation unless they surrender, King Hezekiah, that he rent his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth and went into the house of the Lord. And he sent Eliakim, which was over the household, and Shebna the scribe, and the elders of the priests covered with sackcloth to Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos. And they said unto him, Thus saith Hezekiah, This day is a day of trouble and a rebuke and blasphemy. For the children are come to the birth, and there is no strength, not strength to bring forth. In the siege, because there's no food, no water, people are weak and thin, women that are pregnant don't have the strength to bear their babies, just have the strength to. It may be the Lord thy God will hear all the words of Rabshakeh, whom the king of Assyria his master has sent to reproach the living God, and will approve the words which the Lord thy God hath heard. Wherefore, lift up thy prayer to the remnant that are left. So the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah, and Isaiah said unto them, Thus shall you say to your master, Thus saith the Lord, Be not afraid of the words which thou hast heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Behold, I will send a blast upon him, and he shall hear a rumour, and shall return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. There's much more to it than that in chapters 19 of Second Kings. But you get just the message. Hezekiah went to God, And he said, God, we have no hope but you. That exalted the Lord. Then Isaiah came back and told Hezekiah, don't you worry. God will destroy them completely. The way they came, you'll send them back again. And the king himself will be destroyed by the sword not long after that. Now, in our passage over here in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah asked for God's grace because God's mercy endureth forever. If you ever want God's favour, just ask for his grace. Just ask for his mercy. It endures forever and never runs out. He asked in faith. He said, we have waited for thee. Not run ahead. We have waited for thee. Before we made our own plans to try to make a treaty, it didn't work. Okay, now we're going to wait for thee. He asked for God to be their strength. You be our arm. You be our deliverer, our salvation. They're trusting him completely. In other words, God, we exalt you in the midst of this trial. That's a prayer God loves to answer whenever he's set on high. Never underestimate the power of prayer. We're doing these studies on Wednesday now. 
Prayer is the greatest karma of all thieves. Be anxious for nothing. What do I do? Well, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Prayer is the one greatest thing that will take away all fears. Forget about popping pills. Prayer does a better job than that. Now, Isaiah was confident of God's deliverance. Verse 3 and 4. God will just have to make a noise and the Assyrians will flee. That's all. Just a noise. Nations will flee to his presence. Jerusalem will spoil the Assyrians and leave nothing behind. Like a caterpillar comes along. And caterpillars, they're hungry little fellas, they keep on eating until there's nothing left. Like locusts, locusts run upon an area. I mean, they fly in their multitudes. They get into some area. They eat, eat. There's noise, 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 noise. Like, like uh, uh, termites in a bit of wood. And they keep on going. There's nothing behind. Nothing at all. The Bible says, Jerusalem will spoil the Assyrians like those caterpillars, like the locusts. You see, when the uh, Assyrian army wakes up one day, or <laughs> a few of them wake up, and find the majority are dead, 185,000 men are dead, they're going to get scared like anything and get up and run. They're not going to sit down there and pack up their goods and pack up their tents and get things ready and herd all the animals and their flocks and their herds. and, and no, no way. They're going to get and run for their lives. They'll leave their clothes behind, leave everything behind. Why? Because now they're scared. I mean, 185,000 dead in one night. They're going to flee. And when they flee, guys in Jerusalem will come out and say, mate, look at this. We have all this spoil, this good, these riches, this money, these possessions, these food, everything left behind. They take it home and they become enriched straight away. Now Hezekiah had to strip the temple of the gold and silver to pay Sennacherib. Now <laughs> he gets a whole bunch back again, much more than before. See, God is exalted in prayers of his saints and he rejoices in those prayers. In Psalm 96, now we can't avoid the Psalms today, which I'm glad of. It's a beautiful uh, reading. Psalm 96, verse 1 to 10. Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord, bless his name, show forth his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the heathen, his wonders among the people. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations of idols, I was going to say fools, idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honour and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Give unto the Lord, O ye kindreds of the people. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come to, unto his courts. O worship the Lord in his beauty of holiness, for fear before him all the earth. Say among the heathen that the Lord reigneth. The world also shall be established that it shall not be moved. He shall judge the people righteously. I think it will do us a whole lot of good to read the Psalms regularly and just see how God was exalted and praised in all situations. You find the time of judgment when God comes along and judges enemies or brings enemies upon us. We find that in prayer we can have so much calm. The fear of the Lord is his treasure, the Bible says. Those who fear God serve him from the heart, not through obligation. Those who fear God wait upon him completely. In Psalm 111 verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. His praise endureth forever. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. Now when people trust God, in this situation the Bible says, even the valiant ones of God's people's enemies will cry like babies. The word valiant ones in the Hebrew, literally the lions of, um, the lions of God, uh, or basically lion-like men. It translated two times in, uh, in, uh, with their synonyms in the scripture. They're lion-like men. They're going to cry like babies. The ambassadors, those who sought Jerusalem to surrender, they themselves will weep bitterly. They're thinking themselves so confident. Who has defeated our nation before? Who has defeated Syria? None. All the gods and nations are destroyed completely. Now we give you the offer, the offer now for you to come and to uh, trust in him. Expecting they're going to go away and weep. Well, they're the ones who wept, not Jerusalem. Isaiah 54, 17 says, No weapon that is formed against me shall prosper. Absolutely not. Now, Isaiah, 
in his confidence and his prayer of faith, wasn't ignorant of the present circumstances. Because in verse 8 and 9, he says very plainly, Jerusalem was under siege. It was locked in. The wall, the gates were closed completely. There was no one travelling on the highways to and from Jerusalem. No access to the city was there completely. The Assyrians broke their treaty, invaded the cities of Judah. They showed no mercy. They devastated the land completely. All the valleys, all the hills, reaping all the trees and reaping the crops and destroying what they couldn't reap. It says Lebanon also was cut down. Now, in the Bible, Lebanon is referred to 71 times and uh, heaps of times refers to as the mountains of Lebanon that border Israel with Lebanon. And these mountain ranges were something like 190 kilometres long and they were covered with cedars. And so the Assyrians would come along on these mountains. They would cut down the cedars. They would waste the cedars and waste the fir trees for their own destructive purposes. And so basically, Isaiah knew our nation is hurt real, real grievously by the Assyrians here. Their power is right at their doorstep. And still he prayed in faith and still he had confidence. That is a prayer that exalts God. Then we see also God is exalted in the way he answers prayer. In verse 10, now I'll arise. In answer to this prayer of faith, now I'll be exalted in request for grace. Now I'll lift up myself when when they're after simply God's glory to uh, to be expressed. The battle is the Lord's. In Psalm 68 verse 1, the Bible says, Let God arise, let his enemies be scattered. Let them also that hate him flee before him. God says, now, in answer to prayer, now I'll arise, now I'll get up. Now, God saw Assyria coming. He saw what Assyria did, but he waited and waited and waited. For what? For his people to come to the end of themselves and stop making their own plans and deals and come to him. And when they stopped trying to make treaties with Sennacherib, and they came to him and prayed and prayed sincerely, putting all their hope on him, then God says, now I'll operate, now I'll move, now I'll rise up. The first thing he will do, he will destroy their boasting completely. Hezekiah prayed in verse 17, chapter 19, Of the truth, Lord, the kings of Assyria have destroyed the nations and their lands. So when they come along making all these boastings about what they've done in the past, it's true, God. They destroyed nation after nation, idol after idol, which were no gods, he said, but still they've done that. So I'll give them credence. Yes, they are a true threat. But God says, but listen, They're proposing to destroy my city, my land, my people. No, that's not on. That's not on. Their threats will result in chaff and stubble. In other words, they'll come to nothing. And all their armies and peoples, they'll be destroyed greatly, just like lime and thorns are burned quickly. So they'll be burned up quickly too. If you ever have have a fire, you never ever cook with the thorns because you light a fire with thorns, you don't cook with them. As soon as you put a match to them, whoosh, whole thing's gone up. Like a little, like little bush with little bit of skinny leaves, just gone up in a few seconds, then there's nothing left behind. No, no. So like lime and thorns that they consume very, very quickly, that'll be the army of Assyria. Very quickly, one night, finished. One night for a battle. Normally battles might go for three years to even 20 years. With God, one night, they're gone. They're gone. And the destruction of Assyria will cause other nations to fear uh, 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 the people of God, to fear God's people and fear God of Israel. Now, the Bible says people around the world that are far off will hear of the defeat of Assyria and they will fear. Why is that? Well, they'll ask, how was the Assyrian army destroyed? Was there a great battle in the valley somewhere? Was there a mountain somewhere? Did, did Israel have some confederates with them and they came across them with chariots and, and uh, swords and spears? Uh, how, how was it? What was their weapons they used? What was their, their technique they used? What were their plans? How did they defeat them? And I'll answer, well, there was no war. Well, um, uh, how did it happen then? Well, they did nothing. Well, how many people went against them? Actually, they stayed in their cities, their doors locked, their gates locked, and they stayed inside, and an arrow wasn't even fired. Well, what happened? God of Israel destroyed them. A whole nation? Assyria? Yeah. How? They just woke up dead. Can, can someone wake up dead? Well, their nation woke up and found out their people were dead. 
And that was it. So basically around the world you find people of fear. And also in Jerusalem itself, the mixed multitude, the unbelieving part are going to fear too because they realise that in, in, uh, in heart they're the same as the Assyrians. They're just as wicked. They're just as deceitful. And if God came across, this, came across the series like that, then they too are in danger of dying and being, being judged. We find also God is exalted in the lives of the righteous. This is so important. When God, when people see the works of the righteous, they exalt God. They praise God. They realise, man, people couldn't have done that. All praise goes to God. When you find that uh, David goes along and David had many, all of his victories, the praise went to God. When Jesus did all these miracles, the praise went to the Father. When the disciples did all their miracles, the praise went to God. Whenever you do a mighty work and people think, you can't do that, praise goes to God. The question's asked, who's going to escape God's judgment? I mean, God's a consuming fire. When he comes down in judgment, who's going to escape? Who is it? In Jerusalem, they're the saved and unsaved. Who are going to escape? Well, the Bible says very, very plainly, the righteous. Not righteous in profession. Righteous that show their faith in their deeds. Like James says in the epistle, faith where that works is dead. Now, in Psalm 15, verse 1 to 5, verse 1 says, Who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Lord, who shall dwell in the holy hill? God, who is going to live in your presence? Who is it? And God says, well, those who walk uprightly, work righteously, speak the truth in their hearts, and those who don't backbite or do evil against their neighbour or speak reproach against their neighbour, those who hate wicked devices and who honour the and those who don't honour who honour those who honour the God's people and who make vows at their own expense and fulfil them, those who don't charge uh, the poor for interest and those who don't do deal in bribery, these type of people. Well, in the time of Psalm 15, there were certain sins that were prominent that simply expressed over here. But in this passage, we have different sins that are prominent. In Israel's current time, injustice, oppression, receiving of bribes, bloodshed, they are rampant. So here we have six evidences of being someone who's a true believer. In other words, a true believer is someone who does not walk in harmony with the sins of the world. Is that plain? Whatever the current sins of the world are, the, the, the believer does not walk in harmony with them. He does not conform to them. He's transformed from them. Here we have six things mentioned. First, in his walk, he walketh righteously. Now, our walk refers to our life's conduct our pattern of life, not a single act. In other words, in my life, I walk righteously. It's my pattern of life. Secondly, with his mouth speaks uprightly, just speech, honest, truth, grace, timely, exhortive. When he reproves and rebukes, it's done with grace and with love. Thirdly, he, in his heart, he hates oppression, especially those who seek gain by pressing the poor and the orphan, the widows because they're, they're weak and they can't fight back. Those with, the, with their hands, they will not accept bribes. The Bible says he shakes his hands. He does this. You want to give him some money? He does this. I don't want the money. Don't want the money. Go away. Go away. He is abhorred by bribes. If our men of authority use their position and their power for self-gain and uh, at the expense of the innocent. And also, in his ears, he will not listen to murderous suggestions. In Proverbs 1.10, the Bible says, My son... If sinners entice thee, consent thou not. And with the eyes, he will not look at sinful sights. Psalm 101 verse 3, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work that turn, of them that turn aside. Uh, it shall not cleave to me. A true believer is someone whose faith is seen in contrary to the way the world behaves. We have today with this, this is for you, Sam, too, the coronavirus situation where people are in fear and our governments don't know what to do. They're going from guest to guest based upon fear, fear and fear. Nothing positive comes out of them because they don't know. They just don't know. Well, you see, a true believer says, hold on, they don't know, but God does. They have caused the fear, but we don't. 
So we show our faith in these times. I've seen many, many believers that laugh at this situation. We're not laughing at the trouble that's being caused or love at the fact that people died. It's like a mockery thinking, they don't know if they're coming or going. They've got no idea. They're drawing from straw to straw to straw with the fingers crossed, hoping this might work, that might work, this might work, that might work. And they're, they're, they're forecasting, oh, there's going to be greater peaks of trouble later on and, and, and this and maybe that and maybe this and maybe that. They don't know what's going on. Now you see, a Christian comes on and says, but hold on, God does know what's going on. Everything is right according to his plan. He has a solution in mind completely. No cause of fear. Now, that's where you find a true believer coming through, demonstrating faith in troublous times. And they need to see, people need to see that there is something called faith, that God is God in troubled times as well as good times, and he makes a difference. A true believer has faith in his life by his actions, by his mouth, by his heart, his hands, his ears, his eyes, by the way he conducts himself. And it's very important that we're that our faith make a difference in our present day living. If we're crucified with Christ, if we are new creation in Christ Jesus, born again by the Holy Spirit, something different should show itself in our life. Is that plain? Is that plain? Something different should show itself, especially in troublous times like today. Also we have the last point over here. God is exalted in his kingdom. Verse 17 and 24. Jesus will be enthroned. The Bible says, Thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty. This is very far off right now. This is far off in the future. It hasn't occurred yet, Isaiah is saying, but you will see it. You'll see the king, that's Jesus, enthroned on high in all his glory and all his beauty. And that day is approaching and no evil force can come against him. None whatsoever he will rule with a rod of iron and there'll be no enemy can stand up against him. Speaking of the Assyrian, their scribe that went before them to try and work out and record all the spoils, the receiver who would gather all the spoils, the count of towers who would estimate the strength of a city and work out how much strength they need to destroy that city. They won't come near them. How about the, the people of a foreign language that speak with stammering tongues, the foreigners that come to approach them and destroy them? They won't draw near. Why? Because the king in his beauty is enthroned and he is reigning on high. Now I will set their eyes instead on Jerusalem. Instead of looking around at the enemies, at those approaching, those causing threats, they look at Jerusalem. Why? That's where our king is. That's where he's enthroned. It's the place of the solemn feast, the feast of Passover, the feast of Pentecost, the feast of Tabernacles. In the millennium, there will still be feasts. They'll be commemorative. In other words, these feasts will show forth what happened in the past, what Christ did in the past. It's like having a real life play of what Jesus did. So we understand his great power, great sacrifice, redemptive work upon the cross. And we'll rejoice. It's the city of peace. Now, Jerusalem means city of peace. Juru, city, Salem, peace. And that's the very least it's been in its whole history is a peaceful city. But now it will be a city of peace because it won't be touched anymore. Now, like a, unlike a tent that can be pulled up and pulled down and taken away, the city won't be. Stakes won't be removed from the ground. Cords won't be broken. Tents won't be demolished. It's going to stay forever. And it'll be firmly established, never be destroyed again because Christ is there as its ruler, its king, its lord. And when Christ is going to reign, his people will be defended completely. And he's going to reign with just like having a place with broad rivers and streams round about. A lot of water means there's going to be a lot of refreshing, a lot of vegetation, a lot of fruitfulness. And with God upon his throne, there'll be waters round about over there showing you that there's plenty of supply of that which is needed to give life. Absolutely. And if enemy comes along in their galleys, we're speaking figuratively, they'll be destroyed. They won't even go near the throne of God. No way at all. In other words, no enemy on earth is going to threaten the kingdom of Jesus Christ. At the end of Christ's reign of the thousand years, when God has planned this time now for the great white throne judgment, at that time, Satan is loose for a very short period of time. He has no trouble in amassing a great big rebellion against Jesus, which won't even get off the ground. Because even before they can start the march toward Christ, 
God was in fire from heaven, destroy every one of them, and then they come up before the great white throne judgment seat of Christ, and they'll be judged every one for their sins and cast in the lake of fire. So we find over here that God's throne is secure, his kingdom is certain, he's exalted. He will be judge, ruler, deliver of his people. And in this situation, the Bible says, there'll be no more sickness, verse 24. And even better, all sin to be forgiven, completely forgiven. Now, God is exalted. Whether men want to honour that or not, God is exalted. There is no other. He is God. He always will be God. There is no other. His works declare that very fact. God spoke. This whole universe came into being. Now, that's power. When someone can speak, who do you speak to? There were no angels then. Who did he speak to? As far as we know, there was Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Who did God speak to? And this happened. Who did the doing? Just simply God. We have very little understanding on the true power of our omnipotent God and the resource he has available to him. Outside of time, outside of matter, God is spirit. And this God who is spirit decided one day to bring forth the material universe and by speaking, this whole universe came into existence. How massive, how great, how powerful he must be. Have you ever thought about that? How great God must be for him to bring this universe. He is the cause, universe is effect, and the cause is always greater than the effect, always. He'll be exalted. His works declare it. The unsaved one day bow every knee before God and declare Jesus Christ as Jehovah. And believe us today, we declare it as we walk with the Lord. The Bible says, exalt the Lord our God and worship him at his footstool, for he is holy. Let's bow in prayer. Loving Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. We thank you that you are God in heaven and none can take your place and none can threaten your power or position. You know everything that is happening upon planet Earth, Lord. You've shown your power so many times in destroying all the kingdoms of the world, all the enemies of God's people, no matter what they may be, but they're natural enemies, be they diseases, be they plagues, be they fire and famines. You've destroyed every one of them and you still remain as God. Give us a grace, Lord, to trust you Stand firmly with thee to believe in you completely, Lord, and not fear anything, Father, upon this earth, because you are God. In Christ's name we thank you and pray. Amen. Thank you. God bless.